Let's start over this side of the room. Question is, how do U.S. companies compete with companies from or institutions from countries like China, particularly, who um, uh, will use bribes as a, a modus operandi to as a cost of entry in countries where that's de rigueur, particularly developing nations? That's true. Um, we would love a level playing field. It's very interesting that the leadership, the new leadership of China, which takes official office in the next few days, in their very first statements, talked specifically about corruption. And I think you're going to have in China what you've had in Brazil and you've had in a number of other countries where a highly educated, international, entrepreneurial, rising middle class of younger people are saying, we want to do business honestly. We want the opportunity to operate in markets. So I think internally in China, gradually, very gradually, things will change. But I don't believe that because your competition sometimes pays bribes, that that is an excuse for you to undermine your corporate culture. And my inspiration here is a, a man called Rachel Martin, who was the chairman and CEO of Merck. And I was on the board of the group called the Ethics Resource Center when he was the chairman. And I happened to, we were talking about corruption, I happened to mention Bangladesh. And Mr. Gil Martin banged the table and he said, we at Merck won't do business there because we can't do business along the, li the ethical lines that I think are important for our company. So I think there are some kind of deals that some companies have to say no to. Uh, but yes, it's a reality of this world that there are many competitors from many countries. Look, the Russians have signed the OECD pact, but I don't necessarily believe that Russian companies are not going to be paying bribes <laughs> in the international world. I think we have to be realistic, but I think gradually we can work towards improving the situation. Um, yeah, let, I'll come to you, but let, let's go at the back. We'll come around. We'll come around. Yes, please, please. Uh, Yelena Park, uh, United Way, previously Atlantic Council. Thank you so much for your remarks. I'm originally from Kazakhstan, so I do appreciate the work of TI. You spoke a little bit about technologies and internet, so my question is about WikiLeaks and other whistleblowers. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts about that related to... I, you know, I'm an, I'm an old journalist, so I will defend the freedom of the press, uh, come what may. Except, I don't believe you should have freedom of the press that leads to the point that puts people's lives in danger. And I think the real crime of WikiLeaks, from my perspective, <clears throat> was that the mass dissemination, unedited, of a lot of material posed huge risks to the lives of, of, of people, of individuals who were named in various of these documents that were done. I think that's outrageous. I think that's wrong. More generally, you know, the state of Georgia in Central Europe, I think you can get an app now that tells you for various cities where potholes have not been repaired. And you can find the name of the company that got the contract. You can find the name of the official in City Hall who signed the contract and his phone number. And using your GPS, as it were, you can actually give him a call and say, you know, you signed that contract a year ago and nothing's happened. Uh, don't you think the road in front of our house should be repaired? Technology is being used from ipaytobribe.com through to this app that I talked about on a to a degree that is making it harder and harder for corrupt people and those who pay them to hide. So fundamentally, I believe that transparency is increasing and information is spreading, and that's good. But I do believe that we have to be concerned about fundamental issues of national security and fundamental issues of protecting individuals. And there I part company strongly with WikiLeaks. Yes, sir, right at the back. Hello, I'm Chris Barnes. Thank you so much for being here. We hear a lot from various other parts of the world, often the Chinese, the Russians, and elsewhere, 
that openness and freedom of speech and the press and expression <clears throat> and more specifically transparency are values unique to Western culture and thus not applicable to those other societies or cultures. How do you respond to that? I, I reported in the book, um, Emily and I had dinner with a very prominent professor at Beijing University uh, who took us for, for dinner with his students, graduate students. Um, and uh, in the course of the dinner, I said to him, well, you know, isn't it time that China started to get <clears throat> focus on due process. People could be picked up for three years and just thrown in prison. And he said, to support what you just asked the question, um, that's a Western concept. Here, the party knows best. I think it will be very interesting to see what the leadership in China does in the period ahead. There's a marvelous book by Richard McGregor called The Party that explains sort of chapter and verse a bit about how it works in China uh, within the party system itself. Um, I think ultimately, uh, I'm an optimist, I believe these systems collapse. And you know the story of Peru is so wonderful because when Fujimori was prosecuted, 250 other people were prosecuted at the same time. Um, Attorney General, senators, the, uh, all sorts of people in the Justice Department. These prosecutors went after them even though they were their bosses. And they started to change the system. But in many other countries, the systemic change takes a long time. Look at the long journey of Brazil from its dictatorships in the 80s through the early stages of democracy and onwards. But one point I would make, I don't believe the change happens if it doesn't happen with an environment of economic growth. It is so difficult to get reforms of the kind we could talk about in an environment where the economy is stagnating or going backwards. And a huge uh, focus, I believe, greater focus in, the, in promoting good governments, I believe, of the World Bank today, should be on, on, on growth. Because if you can create the growth environment, the interest of people to go into the formal economy, have more open societies, have, great, have the rule of law become something meaningful for all, I think increases. So I'm hopeful, but I think the progress, the journey will be a long one. And I don't want to in any way exaggerate that. Yes, Madam, you've got a question. We've got a mic down here for the second row, please. <coughs> Hi, Kathy Shanley. I work in the international infrastructure arena. My question is more directed at the United States. Yes, we're FPA here, but it's very nice that we can talk about what the rest of the world should be doing. We'll look at what's going on in this country. Years ago, I worked on something called the Ward Commission as a college student. It was all about the awarding of public building contracts. There was a lot of hub all over about this, a lot of documents created. It didn't stop the big dig crisis. It didn't stop Jefferson County, which right now, until yeah. what happens in Detroit, is the largest bankruptcy protection filed in this country. And next will be Detroit. And so it's nice that we can go around the world and try to tell other countries what to do. But what are we going to do to fix what's going on in this country? Um, it's a great question. And uh, I thought I'd get a question like that. So. <laughs> Last July. USA Today and Gallup published a joint poll of, um, of the concerns on the minds of American voters. Number one, job creation. No surprise. Number two was corruption in government. It beat out the budget, it beat out health care, it beat out terrorism. BBC did a poll, by the way, in Western Europe in September. Number one concern that it found in this poll across Western Europe was corruption. When I hear your question, I think of Mr. Blagojevich, and for, who is now spending 14 years in prison, and he's not the first governor of Illinois by any means uh, to have been sent to prison. I think in this country we do have clearly uh, corruption problems, and in that sense, corruption is a universal problem. 
But I think there's two huge points that I would like to make. We have a very strong judicial system here. We have very courageous, highly skilled public prosecutors and investigators. I think Patrick Fitzgerald in Chicago and in Illinois has done a phenomenal job. One of the heroes. That is a tremendous uh, thing that we should never forget that makes our country and our democracy somewhat stronger than I think many others. And second of all, however bad these crimes of corruption are in this country, and when you look at $6 billion being spent in the last election cycle, and so much of that money is unaccounted for, and thanks to actions by the Supreme Court in 2010, that we can now get anonymous contributions into the system, which is a really retrograde step. People smell corruption in the system that breeds distrust that's very bad. Nevertheless, it's not the very, very poor who get trampled upon and forced into terrible poverty from our corruption in the way it happens in Equatorial Guinea, in the way it happens in so many of the world's poorest countries. Uh, and to that extent, I think there is a huge difference. But I think you're right to mention it because clearly we have major problems here at home that need to be addressed. Um, I think we can take a couple more. And then. You all got dinner. <laughs> you yes, mentioned, sir, right at the back. They will come you mentioned so many times Russia, and in the same way you can mm. mention all another republic, maybe beside Baltic countries, where all wealth were created through corruption, and it's obvious for everybody it did not prevent America to deal with Russia, even they know very well with whom they deal. But to begin with, Russian reformers were not so smart to establish a system which allowed them to do everything what they did. It was International Monetary Fund from which Stiglitz, Joseph Stiglitz even resigned because he predicted what happened if Russia accepted this recommendation. So maybe would America not just Sorry, okay, okay, about Magnitsky, right. but also about people who initiate right. all of this mess. Well, yes. Uh, I write in the book, um, I open one of the chapters uh, by recalling some of, the, uh, some of the events that happened in the High Court in London last year when Mr. Berezovsky sued Mr. Abramovich. Uh, two oligarchs who this, where Mr. Berezovsky fell out with Putin, so he's now exiled in London, and where he was suing Mr. Ber Mr. Abramovich for $6 billion. Uh, he thought he could get justice in the UK because he couldn't get it in Russia, he said. Um, and he said this was owed to him because basically he had facilitated massive theft of Siberian oil interests for Mr. Abr Mr. Abramovich and hadn't got the payoff. And if you look at what that happened in that trial and what the testimony of Abramovich and Berezovsky, it's, it's, it's absolutely insane. Uh, it's horrific. Never before in history have so few stolen so much from the state in such a quick time as the oligarchs did in Russia. Um, I was on a panel a long time ago uh, once with a journalist from Izvestia and I was talking about you know, sort of things I'm talking about tonight and he sort of threw up his hands and said, but we have a thousand year tradition of corruption in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> My point though is this. You are right that the United States has not been forceful enough. But I make a, an effort in my book to underscore the enormous work that Hillary Clinton did in her term as Secretary of State to go to many, many countries, including Russia, to encourage civil society. President Obama stood on a stage with my friend Elena Pavlova, introducing him in Moscow a few years ago in front of civil society to encourage them to speak truth to power. We in the US have many strategic concerns and many issues, and it is very complicated to simply single out one issue or another. But 
Norm Eisen, who was the head of the ethics office at the White House in the first part of the Obama administration, is now the ambassador, our ambassador in the Czech Republic. A very outspoken person on this issue of corruption, who's organized conferences in the Czech Republic with other Central and East European ambassadors to raise public awareness of issues. So I think, particularly noting what Hillary has done, I think the effort is being made but it has to be set alongside other parts of the relationship. And I think it's complicated, but I'm very worried about what is happening in Russia today and the threats to civil society. Maybe one last question, because I think you- I think we have time for a couple. Friends. Oh, a couple, oh, wonderful, okay, good. Because there's lots of hands up. I just didn't want to keep people. Um, well, yes, sir, please. You and then I think you had one right here, so. I'm sorry, we'll come back. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Yasin. I work with Morgan Stanley and Wealth Management, so please take my opinion with a grain of salt, as it seemingly has nothing to do with foreign policy. I think I have an answer to your what is a sufficient punishment question. Oh, good, okay. I think. It's very outside of the box. I'll leave it up to everybody else in the room to bring it back inside of the box. If you take a look back to Nike and when they were using sweatshops, nothing changed in corporate culture to bring those, to, to get rid of the sweatshops until consumers made a conscious decision to change who they were buying from. Then that dictated Nike's actions right. and other corporations followed suit when consumers decided not to buy certain products anymore. Maybe whistleblowing is a good step in the right direction to inform people of what's going on, at least in terms of corporate uh, corruption. I think your book is probably a great step. I think what we could maybe do for a punishment is take the fines and use them as marketing dollars to inform via advertisements of what these corruptive practices are and inform the public. And again, I'll leave it to you to show me well, where the I, holes I, are in that yeah, theory. I think it's a fascinating point. Uh, and I think, you know, if you followed that thought, Again, I would make the point, it is not a victimless crime. When you look at the settlement decrees, settlements that are done between corporations, like HSBC in the last case, or uh, corporations who violated the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, there are no mention of victims. The fact that the budgets of countries have been completely distorted by this bribery that uh, people's lives in many cases have been trampled upon because of the way the bribes went and the, the consequences thereof are not mentioned in these settlements. They're not mentioned in all of the litigation of, that you see here in the US about these things. And maybe if the public understood that corruption is never victimless, maybe we will get a greater public pressure, if you will, uh, for some meaningful action. So, I welcome that. And we have a question right here at front. And yes. I think we need a mic because otherwise people won't hear you. Susan, so it's just coming. Just coming. Susan Sinterhofer, I appreciate how you talked about China and Russia. I wanted to ask you specifically what you thought about India. I know I've had colleagues that were very optimistic about India a few years ago and are now very pessimistic that they can't get past the corruption to do business in India. So. I want to make a plug for Annabelle uh, and the Partnership for Transparency Fund in answering your question on India. Okay. These huge countries, you look at them and you look at the scale of poverty and you look at the scale of corruption and you say, oh, we'll never get to grips with this. Uh, PDF, which is, um, what is it called, a 503C, so please press the right button on our, on our website, support PDF. PTF has supported a group in Orissa State that in turn has supported 15 women's groups, mostly women's groups, in a program that we call the Citizens Action Against Corruption. What is this in its essence? Four years ago, after a very long campaign by tremendous uh, activists, Indian people, men and women, 
India passed a Freedom of Information Law. And the, the PDF program that supports the Citizens Action uh, is training women, mostly women, in lots of communities, how to get their rights through the Freedom of Information Law. How does this work? In a nutshell, a woman is given a voucher by the city that says you are entitled to a city job. But when she goes to City Hall, they say, we're very sorry, there are no city jobs. Come back some other time. She's trained with other people in her community. And as a group, they go to City Hall. And they say, we've got the training. We know what our rights are. And our right is that we can see the public sector employment roles. And they open the, these officials, unfortunately for them, have to open the roles. And they look through the list, and what do they find? Half the people with jobs are dead. <laughs> because the officials have pocketed salaries. Now, as this pressure has mounted, and as this PTF program has gone forward, and more and more citizens groups have become involved, and now today, something like 220,000 people are involved, and this is just the start. As more and more of these people become involved, a magical thing happens. Officials who don't basically like the corrupt system start to want to cooperate and want to be helpful. And so instead of a vicious cycle, you get a tremendous beneficial cycle happening. Officials start to understand the law and understand the rights of people. They start to build pressures, and things gradually change. Now, there are reverses. Fell over into the corporations I don't know. I'm, I'm talking, so corrupt, you know, so uh, I can't solve all the problems. <laughs> but I'm just saying, at this level, uh, it is very encouraging. There are an enormous amount of citizens groups in India that are doing a lot of very good things on absolute shoestring budgets. And they are finding very gradually that there are officials who are willing to work with them and to help them. It's, you know, it's a long way. And it's just like it's a long way, even if they pass laws in, in, in Delhi that will affect uh, big cor corporations, it will still be a long time before it's reformed. Uh, I do not want to sound like some sort of, uh, you know, uh, non-stop optimist here. This is a, a huge battle. It involves people's lives and huge reverses. And India is enormously difficult. And you can go there and talk to anti-corruption people, uh, and it's heartbreaking at, at, at how many years they've tried and how little success they've had in some cases. But there are also good stories. And the PDF one is a good one. Yes, sir. And then, um, and then we'll take you and then I think we're on. Thank you. Um, I am uh, actually a cancer doctor. I work in New York City. And I grew up in Argentina during the Dirty War. Somehow I'm alive. Um, so the question I have is that I noticed that the little kids, when they go to the playground, uh, you know, they play together. There's not too much competition. They share the balls and, uh, you know, whatever, the toys, whatever. And then they start getting older and older, whatever. They go to school and, you know, they start taking tests, SATs, MCATs, law school, um, New York City, Buenos Aires. Whatever. So I noticed that there is a moment that corruption start picking up slowly, you know. Um, you know, getting a, going to a better place, getting a better job, um, coming to places to network so somebody else will get to. So it seems to me that in my head, that corruption is inside in our uh, you know, cells. Uh, I don't know if it's a way of survival or whatever it is. And I do agree with you that we should create um, you know, guidelines and you know, pol policies to uh, you know, organize societies. But my question is, um, like, you know, when, when do you think that um, when so so this is the way that I see it. We we have been you know talking. We need a well, because we this is the question. This is the question. Sorry. We have been here talking about all this stuff. The question is the moral values. 
and 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 and, and sit down at the table with the parents when the parents say to you, "Be nice, don't do that to your neighbor." And we forgot this. The name of the game now is to have the better car sure. and to have um, the better house and to have the better uh, 300,000 okay. shoes and things I like think that. I know so when going. is the time okay. to start answer. talking okay. about moral values? Let me answer the question very simply. Uh, when my friend Peter Eichen convened this conference to launch TI 20 years ago, one of the people he invited was a man called Obasanjo, who became president of, who had been president, became president again of Nigeria who made a very determined, very forceful statement at that meeting and said, we have to find a way that our children don't believe that going into politics is the way to get rich. Um, now, Obasanjo himself is a controversial person. Uh, but he did go to prison for opposing the Abacha regime and speaking about corruption in the 1990s. And that was a very courageous thing to do. And I think he was very sincere in that comment. And then I'm reminded of a different conversation. Quite a few years ago, I sat down with uh, my friend Jia Song Kim, who created Transparency International Korea, and who had been beaten up and imprisoned for human rights violations in the late 50s and early 60s in Korea. Uh, he has started a youth movement against corruption in Korea, because he believes you have to talk about these issues in the schools. <laughs> right down there in the lower schools that you cannot wait till the children go on. Uh, and he's very convinced of this, and he has had enormous success in what he's tried to do in Korea in terms of getting the public to accept that this is a useful thing to do. And so the movement is growing in Korea. I don't have the answers for you. I don't, I, 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 I don't have that depth of sort of knowledge. But I do think that what Geosync is trying to do should, is something we ought to focus more about because it clearly, I think he's right. You have to start very, very young. Yes, let's take two quick questions. And then, yes, please. I noticed that you use Nigeria a lot as you know, your, for example. But sorry, my name is Edith. Um, I realize that you, I noticed you use Nigeria a lot as your base for what you are talking regarding corruption. But I realize that there is no Transparency International chapter in Nigeria. At the moment, there isn't. You're right. So what's being done since Nigeria seems to be a lot of people's foundation or definition of corruption? Um, it's a very good question. We've had a chapter for a long time. Uh, sometimes civil society organizations do not find themselves to be sustainable. Uh, then you have to go out and re rebuild them and rekindle them. And we, I have colleagues from, uh, who are trying to find the right partners now because there, are, in fact, are more civil society organizations now in Nigeria in this space than used to be the case 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, uh, I don't only want to use the bad examples of Nigeria. I think someone like Ngozi is an incredible leader uh, who I quoted earlier. And, um, uh, Nuhu Ribadu was the police commissioner of, of Nigeria, uh, who I think tried very, very hard to directly address corruption in Nigeria. Finally, he was forced into exile, but this was not after various laws had been changed for the better. Um, we need a TI in Nigeria. I should also say, I don't want to, even in countries where we have chapters, we have huge problems. I got emails today from my friend Michaela Wong in Kenya. Michaela is an incredible journalist. And uh, after you've read my book, please read uh, It's My Turn to Eat, which is by Michaela, who the book is about corruption in Kenya and ethnic strife. And she says that this last election that took place on Monday has been horrendously bungled. And she is incredibly worried about something exploding literally imminently. We have a strong civil society chapter there. We have a strong chapter in Zambia. We have over 2,000 members in Zambia, of TI Zambia. But we're a small drop in the ocean. There are other great groups out there too. So I don't think it's just TI, but I think it's a good question. And we will have another chapter there, I promise you. One last question. Yes, sir. Yes, please.
Hi, my name is Michael Primer with Veracity Worldwide. We're a consulting firm here that does a fair amount of FCPA-related work. Uh, I want to pick up your point about the variety of faces of corruption or types of corruption. You know, clearly the Mubaraks and Ben Ali's of the world are much different in terms of their corruption than a low-level bureaucrat or a teacher or a police officer. Um, and for the for the latter group, a lot of it is not, you know, it, it's corruption that causes poverty, but also corruption that results from poverty, you know, with officials who are bureaucrats or police officers making such low salaries. Corruption is a way to supplement the salary, you know, make a living for yourself when the government, who's your employer, is not actually giving you enough to survive. Um, so wondering what your, what Transparency International or what the kind of global uh, NGO community is doing regarding that issue of the corrupt officials who are not on the, you know, top of the totem pole, but the ones who are low and, and need the kind of corruption to survive, you know, what's, what's the systemic solution to that problem? Well, uh, in fact, all the projects that the Partnership for Transparency Fund does, it does brilliantly, of course, but it actually does it very, very well, it has a tremendous success rate are directly involved in this petty corruption. But the reality is that in countries where small-scale petty corruption, if you will, by low-level officials is endemic and very widespread, it's in those countries where grand corruption also is pervasive. Uh, you don't find the one you don't, without the other, as it were. And it is wrong to only concentrate on the lower levels, although there are lots of good things that are being done by many groups. We run an annual survey called our barometer, where we find that, for example, the most prevalent form of low-level corruption is extortion by the police, uh, followed by health, followed by education, uh, in many of the poorest countries of the world. The World Bank does incredibly good studies of this and does a lot of analysis and does a lot of good programs in this area. And you clearly have to raise people's wages above, a living, above the survival level or below, even below it that, in order to deal with some of this problem. But never lose sight, I would argue, of the fact that in those countries you have grand corruption as well. And if you do not deal with the grand corruption or try to deal with the grand corruption, I don't believe you will be able to do something on a sustainable basis about the lower level corruption. So the two have to go hand in hand. I think it's incredibly difficult. What encourages me, I hope encourages you, is that the conversation has never been as vibrant. So maybe we can get together in some other forum or do this in some other way um, to continue uh, a discussion. And thank you for supporting the organizations I work with. And thank you for your attention this evening. And thank you very much, Phil. And thank you, FTL.